Now, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce our moderator, Noah Gaffney, Executive Director of the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation. Noah began her career as a social entrepreneur. Then, after completing her MBA, Noah joined the World Economic Forum. She followed that by launching Impact Squared, a movement-building consultancy that worked with UNICEF, International Crisis Group, and a number of leading foundations. Noah is a regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, Huffington Post, and the New York Times. She's an affiliate at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society and a Social Innovation Fellow at the University of Cambridge. Noah, I'm making the handoff and you can take it from here. Wonderful, thank you so much, Margaret. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today uh, as part of the inaugural launch of the Leadership Seminar Series. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to share the expertise across Rutgers Business School and, and really highlight a few of the individuals working locally, nationally, and internationally to make a big difference. And based on the Rutgers 4Rs principles of resilience, resourcefulness, responsibility, and reinvention. And I can think of no better person to kick this off than someone who has uh, responsibility at the core of everything he does, uh, Gary Cohen. So I'll just share a few highlights of Gary's background and I'll let him take it from there. Um, but Gary is Executive Vice President of Global Health at BD and President of the BD Foundation. Um, he's also deeply involved with UNICEF USA as its board director. Um, he was previously co-chair of GBC Health. Uh, he founded an organization called Together for Girls, which um, focuses on uh, reducing sexual violence for women and girls. Um, he's very, very involved with a number of initiatives, the United Nations, uh, World Economic Forum, and others. And he's also a double Rutgers alum and the founder of the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation. And so before we kick off, I just wanted to hear a little bit from Gary about his own background and his own words, and just hear a little bit more, Gary, about your passion and history in um, social impact. Sure, of course. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's keeping well, keeping healthy. Uh, when you flash up that picture, it reminded me I, I need a haircut. I think haircuts have been scarce, tough to come by. I was going to cut my own hair before this uh, webinar, but I figured, I don't know, I'm probably better off having a little bit too much hair than having a sloppy haircut. So, uh, And I certainly don't have too much hair. If, if you look at the top of my head, you can see that. So Noah, go ahead. Uh, shoot away. I'm ready. Wonderful. Um, so Gary, I know there are a number of people on the line uh, who are students and alumni who are really curious to hear more about your background and your own journey. Um, what led to your passion for social impact and how have you embedded it in your career? Well, I have to say, as in many things, I can't say I had anticipated things would turn out exactly as they did. I, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a, a double Rutgers grad. I graduated from Rutgers College, uh, the former what was called Rutgers College, now College of Arts and Sciences, in 1980 to show my age. And then in 83, I worked for one year in what was truly a dead-end job and then went back full-time, got the got an MBA from what's today Rutgers Business School. That was a great experience for me. I actually was recruited by BD on campus, although that job didn't open up for four months, so I went to work for Maidenform, which was a company uh, founded by my grandfather's sister. She had invented the bra and started the company Maidenform. But my passion was in healthcare, so I moved over to BD as a market research analyst. Things moved very fast in the company. Again, I wasn't expecting that. From entry level, I was leading the company's largest business uh, 11 years later, and then led another business, and then led European operations, and then was a finalist for CEO, one of two finalists in the late 1990s. Uh, the other finalist was given the job, and I was very pleased to run the medical segment of the company uh, for 10 years, which was about 65% uh, of the company at the time, then international operations, and then another finalist again for CEO. And then um, along the way, I would say starting in the in the later 1980s i started working on a social impact issue which was protection of health workers from occupational injuries which is very relevant today in the time of COVID 19. back then it was really more in response to the hiv and aids pandemic and the risk 
of health workers contracting HIV or hepatitis on the job. And that ended up not just having enormous social impact, but it ended up becoming a very large growth driver for the company. And I'll speak more about that intersection between social impact and growth, which is a concept known as shared value creation. And then by the late, um, by the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, he got very involved with HIV and AIDS and started traveling frequently to Sub-Saharan Africa. And that work really started around health system strengthening and diagnostic testing. And then it kind of spilled over into some human rights work. And that's uh, when I decided to, uh, to found Together for Girls in 1999, which is now operating in 23 countries because I understood the linkage between sexual violence and HIV spread, as well as the human rights violations associated with it. And then in 2004, I founded the Global Health Function at, at BD, uh, largely in response to HIV and AIDS, where we engaged in a lot of cross-sector collaboration. And um, by the early part of this decade, it just made sense for me to shift my focus full-time to global health and working with a lot of external organizations, some of which you mentioned, like the United Nations and others, uh, and to really work almost as a liaison between the business sector and the international agency, nonprofit, civil society world. And it's kind of a very interesting perspective I'm able to gain working between those different sectors. And uh, one thing I mentioned, I've given the commencement address at Rutgers Business School twice, once for the undergrads and then for graduate students. And I, when I gave the first commencement address, the key theme was in your walk through life, choose your unplanned paths deliberately. And uh, that's, that's a message I try to deliver to students because you can't plan what's going to happen or for everything that's going to happen, but you can have a set of principles behind your decision making. And that's what occurred for me. It, when I understood how much social impact you can have from the business sector, I made a very deliberate turn towards social impact through the business sector as the focus of my professional life and, and a good part of my personal life as well. Great. And as we mentioned previously, you founded the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation. What made you decide to launch the Institute and, and why now in particular? Well, I would say it's a direct outcome of what I just described that I've had the benefit of first of working for a phenomenal company. Uh, for those of you who don't, who don't know BD or Becton Dickinson, it's a 123 year old company. Uh, it's very large now. We have uh, over 65,000 people, about uh, over $65 billion market capitalization. It's a big company. It's gotten a lot larger over the time that I was working there, but always has had been a beneficial social impact. And I'll talk about that more uh, when I um, when I present. Though the, the learning that I was able to gain working in this space between the business sector, the public sector, and the nonprofit sector led to business models and a lot of realizations that I thought could be useful and other very progressive companies, sort of the, those at the leading edge, also regaining a lot of practical experience that I felt could work its way into business school curriculum and really help establish future generations of business leaders who embedded positive social impact into their business agendas. And of course, this actually coincides with a broader trend in that direction impact investing and ESG investing, and a general expectation among society and customers that companies will do good in society as opposed to doing harm. And so the timing seemed right, Rutgers seemed right, and uh, that's why I decided to uh, put the personal time and effort and funds into founding this institute. Wonderful. And of course, as we see, this is a broader trend and, and with the COVID 19 pandemic, this is becoming more and more of an issue and coming to the fore even more. And so with that, Gary, I'd like to hand it over to you. I know you have a presentation talking about BD's work in this space and, and how that relates to corporate social innovation. So I'll hand it over to you. Okay. And uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Uh, maybe just a quick uh, affirmation. <laughs> Noah, can you see the screen? Yes, absolutely. Okay. You can see it, then everybody else can see it. That's terrific. So indeed, I would say that COVID-19, excuse me, let me get back into slideshow, has many, many companies now practicing so corporate social innovation, whether they realize it or not. You know, a global crisis really has a, a, a way of fixing our attention on the common threat. And what I'm gonna go through here is a little bit of background on what corporate social innovation is. Not a lot of time there. We can spend more time there in a future webinar, but just a, a grounding. And then I'm gonna go into, as an example, how the place where I'm still employed full time, how BD is responding 
to, to COVID-19 as an example of how the principles of corporate social innovation are put into play during a major crisis. But let's start just by defining this, because corporate social innovation is not a term of art that people would instantly recognize and uh, have a common view of. So this is the definition that we've been using within the Institute, that corporate social innovation integrates a company's full range of capabilities and assets within innovative business models to achieve positive societal impact while advancing the success and the sustainability of the enterprise. So this is not strictly, as you'll see in the next slide, about philanthropy or just strictly about doing good. Good comes out of corporate social innovation, but it's also about supporting the success and the long-term sustainability of the business itself. So within the teaching methods we have, which are actually an outgrowth of my personal experience, we talk about four different methods of achieving corporate social innovation. And these can be used individually or for the most progressive, most sophisticated companies. They're used collectively as part of an integrated corporate social innovation strategy. So first is, is what everybody thinks of first, strategic philanthropy. And that's providing cash or in-kind donations and doing so in a manner that's strategically aligned with company purpose. So for example, BD is a company that works in healthcare. So not surprisingly, a lot of our strategic philanthropy is in the arena of healthcare. If you're a company that works on information dissemination, you may do more work on education. If you're a company that's in the broad food industry, you might focus on nutrition. So the, every company in my view can have a linkage through their philanthropy to something that also supports their purpose as a company. The second is corporate social responsibility. This is a term that really became popularized in the prior decade. And here it's companies using their core competencies, not just their treasure, not just their cash and product, but their know-how to achieve a positive social impact, but in a manner that doesn't have a direct linkage back to business impact. Uh, so a lot of the environmental sustainability work has been in uh, corporate social responsibility. When BD does training, and we do extensive training, particularly in developing countries of health workers that doesn't have a direct business impact, that would be considered corporate social responsibility. A third area is advocacy and policy change, and fewer companies do this in the manner that I'm gonna describe it. Many companies, particularly in the US, have offices in Washington, DC, particularly the large companies. They may be doing lobbying, traditional lobbying in the company's interest, but when you use your advocacy and policy change and your influence on laws, guidelines, and regulations, in the public interest, for the public good, in areas where you as an organization have expertise, you have depth, that's how this one would work as a, as a method of corporate social innovation. So I mentioned before protecting health workers. We ended up doing work that led to changes in national laws in the United States and then changes in guidelines and regulations throughout the European Union to protect health workers. I was standing behind President Clinton in November 2000 when he signed the first national law to protect health workers from sharp object injury injuries. And that not only drove great progress on the issue, it was also ultimately beneficial to the company because we were able to upgrade and refresh our products, needle-based products, in order to protect health workers. That would be an, a big example of using advocacy and policy change. And last, which I briefly mentioned already, is shared value creation. And these are using business models, commercial strategies, focused on a positive societal impact. So developing a new product or service, for example, that fulfills an unmet societal need, and this should be a need that's well recognized in society, not just a, a priority of the company, and by doing so, you create business opportunity. And Michael Porter and Mark Kramer of Harvard um, have really popularized this term and have been the practice leaders, uh, and Harvard has a course specifically devoted to shared value creation, much like now Rutgers Business School has coursework specifically devoted to corporate social innovation. It's the use of these four methods to have as an integrated strategy for positive social impact. This is what the most progressive companies are doing. So now let's turn to COVID-19 and sort of, excuse me for saying it this way, but the mother of all crises, at least in modern times. It continues to spread worldwide. Um, we've been updating these numbers within BD continuously as we communicate externally. But as of just yesterday, nearly 5 million total combined cases in the world, over 300,000 deaths here in the US, which unfortunately is the country most impacted. Look at all the red on the map there. Over one and a half million, nearly a third of the global cases and approaching 100,000 deaths. And I'm not gonna get political here because it's not the time and place. Uh, and I actually am not a political person. I, I love policy, I don't love politics, but we have not handled this well as a country. 
And you can attribute that anywhere you want, but we've not handled it well, unfortunately, and we're paying the price for it now. And that's also evidenced by this chart. This is actually a, uh, a methodology that uh, WHO uses. I don't think WHO has handled things particularly well either for that matter. But what this shows is the cascading impact from a global pandemic such as this and what you need to do to keep it under control and what happens when it gets out of control. So really items one through six, if they're done really well, strong communication, identifying cases early on, and then doing what's called contact tracing. Contact tracing is a proven methodology in epidemiology and public health that you identify someone who is infected and then you understand, you find out who all their contacts are and you trace and monitor those contacts. For example, in the Ebola pandemic in 2014, contact tracing was widely used. Surveillance, uh, so you have data to show where outbreaks are occurring using uh, proven public health methods, preventing spread of infection. You know, you, you, people know more about hand washing and masks now than we ever have in this country, and then using laboratory testing. And this was has been actually one of the big things that's been insufficient. The countries around the world that were very aggressive with lab testing early on got the pandemic under control much more quickly. If you do those first six things really well, it doesn't get to broad proportion. What happens when you don't, and this is the situation we're in here in the US, is then you're getting into case management because you have a lot of sick and unfortunately some very sick people and that causes hospitals to be uh, overwhelmed as has happened, uh, crowding out other procedures, ICUs that can't possibly take care of the number of people coming in. And ultimately that cascades into a social response uh, and literally in, in the US and in many other countries needing, most countries now, needing to shut down societies. So what we've seen and the reason that that arrow gets a darker red as you go down is we've come down this pathway to more of an out of control situation. Now at the risk of being overcritical, I, I don't wanna be overcritical. This has been a really tough thing to handle and we have great organizations like the US CDC that I think also got overwhelmed a bit, WHO got overwhelmed. I'm not looking to point a finger of blame, but there's lessons to be taken away from how uh, this was responded to in the world. And there's some best practice examples. Uh, Taiwan would be an example, South Korea is an example, New Zealand, which thinks it can actually eradicate COVID-19. And then you have other examples, which includes many countries, including the United States, where it got out of control. This, of course, was exacerbated by shortages of vital supplies, personal protective equipment. One of the reasons that masks weren't recommended early on in the U.S. was because there was knowledge that there wouldn't be enough masks. Who thought even about toilet paper running out? That was the big thing everybody was going for early on. But vital medical equipment like ventilators, uh, swabs to do diagnostic tests is really only two major manufacturers of swabs. And of course, all these companies were doing everything they could to ramp up production. I'll talk more about that in a moment on the BD side, but it couldn't keep up and diagnostic tests as well. So I'm going to shift now into an example of how we've mobilized uh, within the business sector, but this mobilization is going on, as you know, across all sectors. And much of the work that I've been engaged in and most of what I've seen in shared value creation, if you're going to tackle a really big social problem, you need to work across all the sectors. The business sector alone, certainly not one company alone, is not gonna solve a major problem. Government alone is not gonna solve a major problem like this. Uh, and other problems as well, it's not just COVID-19. Nonprofit organizations on their own aren't gonna do it, and you need to engage civil society. So without going through all the sub bullets here, suffice it to say major issues like COVID-19, HIV and AIDS, maternal and newborn mortality is another area we're working on. Uh, sexual violence is an area I'm working on outside of my work directly in BD, all these require cross-sector collaboration. I would say you can't tackle a big major global issue or even countrywide issue without working across the sectors. So for COVID-19, you know, it's been all hands on deck in BD. We are a healthcare company, a supply, medical supply, diagnostic, med tech company. And as such, we have a critical role to play. And in fact, it's fair to say, if we stop producing, hospitals stop operating. That's how fundamental we are to hospital care. And when we started mobilizing, it, we sort of turned all of our attention to what we could do to address the COVID-19 pandemic. And these eight things, I'm not gonna go through all eight of them. In fact, I'm, I've chosen four to go through for today's purposes, just uh, for time management. These eight represent a huge amount of work that's going on across the 65,000 plus people we have in the company, more than half of which 
our front line. You know, you can think about health workers being front line and food workers being front line, distribution workers being front line. Manufacturing workers who are producing vital medical supplies are also frontline workers, and they've had to continue working uh, with some personal risk because anyone who's out there in the environment now has some personal risk uh, to ensure that hospitals could do what they need to do. So I'm going to go through the four that I've highlighted. First, diagnostic testing. I, I never thought there'd be a time in human history where diagnostic testing would be in the news literally every day. As a diagnostics manufacturer, we never would have anticipated that. We've been doing everything we can to scale up diagnostic testing. And as I mentioned before, it started with swabs. There was a tremendous shortage of the simple medical device that you need to use to draw a sample for anything but blood-based tests, for nasal tests. Um, and so that was the first area of focus. And we were collaborating with the US government on this, with the Gates Foundation. Uh, and many others, and the production of swabs is massively higher now than it was. And because of the work between industry, the Gates Foundation, and US government, new types of swabs have also been qualified to further increase supply. Then there's three different types of uh, diagnostic tests. You may have read about this for COVID-19. One is a molecular or a PCR test. It's done in a central laboratory. It's the most accurate, it's highly accurate. It's the gold standard, if you will. And we have substantially ramped up production of those tests. Other manufacturers have as well. We're hoping to soon launch an antigen test that could be done at point of care, which means it could be done in a doctor's office or a retail pharmacy. A simple handheld instrument is all that's needed. That's also a primary diagnostic for COVID-19 to test whether you have the virus or not. And we also are working on a second generation serology test, and you probably have read a lot about these in the news, which is an antibody test. And it's really not to diagnose if you ha have COVID-19, more so it tells you if you've had COVID-19, and therefore you may have built up antibodies that make you resistant to getting it again, at least for some period of time. And up until very recently, it wasn't really clear whether antibodies conferred resistance to catching COVID-19 again, although now there's some just recent data as of this week indicating, as expected, that there is resistance. So this serology test can play a key role in understanding when it may be appropriate for people to start to return to work. So that's diagnostic testing. I talked about the, the criticality of ensuring supply to hospitals. And this, for us, at least internally, is a touching slide because these are our manufacturing workers going to the plant, having to practice social isolation in a difficult circumstance. And these are plants throughout the world. You see one you know, where the workers here are in French. I think you have one here that's in Spanish as well, uh, one from Utah. And these are the workers recognizing their role in society. If they stop producing product, hospitals stop operating. And uh, just as society in general has been expressing its appreciation to frontline health workers, we've been doing what we can to express appreciation to our own manufacturing workers for their commitment to keep our plants going. And you can see in this slide the way that they've ramped up capacity. We went from a certain type of uh, test kit from 5,000 per year that we were producing to 8,500 per week. That gives you an indication of how much strain and, and, and action we've put into place in manufacturing facilities. Why is this so critical? I can tell you, among other things, uh, much of what happens in an ICU involves BD equipment, uh, infusion pumps, medication management systems, drug dispensing systems, all sorts of different catheters that are central line catheters that would go in, in, into the neck, midline catheters, peripheral access catheters, urinary drainage catheters. All these things are vital for the continuing operation of intensive care units. And again, we've had to ramp up production to keep pace much as hospitals have had to ramp up the beds, the number of beds available in intensive care units. And that's really evidenced in the next slide. We were also engaged in helping stand up these field hospitals in places like New York City and Chicago and, and outfitting them with infusion pumps and medication uh, dispensing systems and critical care devices so that they could start to care for patients. And this was done in many places throughout the world, as well as expanding training that we've done with new uh, clinicians entering the workforce and also cross-training our own people to be able to handle a, per, a broader set of responsibilities. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to also speak about the, the work that our frontline workers have needed to do to go into hospitals and service medical equipment. We've had people who've had to continue to work in the hospital environment. We have today about 45% of our workforce working from home, those who are not frontline, people such as myself, I've been working from home since March 13th, but about 55% of our workforce continues to have to work much like uh, food workers have to continue to work. 
part of this collaboration also, I mentioned, is working with governments and global health agencies. And I, I don't have the global health agency slide in the presentation, but in terms of governments, we've been working with governments throughout the world. Uh, we participated in some of the White House press briefings on, on expanding access to diagnostics. You can see how diverse in this slide the countries that we've been working with, Mexico, India, Singapore, Canada, uh, working with the European Commission. And the, all the work we've done for many years, even for decades, on cross-sector collaboration meant that we didn't have to start these relationships the, for the first time right in the middle of a crisis. And I, I would recommend to any company that may seek to use advocacy and its policy activities for positive social impact, don't wait for a crisis. Build those relationships because we've had the benefit of very high trust in our relationships. Those that we are working with, whether it's a government or whether it's the Gates Foundation or the World Health Organization or the Global Fund for HIV AIDS and Malaria, TB and Malaria, they know us already uh, and, and we built up trust. They know our motives are aligned with theirs. And that makes it very natural then to team up and work together at a time when you're in a crisis situation such as we are now. And uh, I've mentioned a number of different areas. I've talked about things that are CS, that are corporate uh, social responsibility. I've talked about shared value creation. I've talked about advocacy. We've also been very engaged in philanthropy and particularly in supporting frontline nonprofit organizations working all over the world. Uh, we've uh, we so far given out almost $3 million, just under $3 million in, in aid to a pretty broad cross-section of different organizations. As you can see here, I won't read them all off, but they're working in the US, they're working in Europe. The earliest ones were working in China. China Red Cross was one of the first ones we started to support. But importantly now, organizations that are working on the front lines in low resource developing countries, which are just more vulnerable than any place else. And uh, we're not hearing, we only heard to date about 100,000 infections in Sub-Saharan Africa, but you know, it, it, the reporting there and the access to testing probably mean that there's a lot more going on. And we're just hoping that the fact that the population of Sub-Saharan Africa is relatively young. If you look at the demographics around the world, the youngest population of any region of the world is, is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Hopefully that will protect them at least to some degree, but offsetting that is when you have high uh, incidence or populations with HIV or TB, those immunocompromised populations will, uh, will, will be vulnerable. So we all have, you know, we're all praying for, for sub-Saharan Africa and that this pandemic doesn't take an even deeper toll there and we're doing what we can to support their response. And I mentioned uh, engaging on the front lines beyond the work we're doing officially as a company. We've had people going above and beyond the call of duty, uh, arranging emergency shipments of, of test kits. We have a lot of clinicians working in BD, doctors and nurses and pharmacists and others and we put forward a policy enabling them to volunteer to work in the clinical environment. So we have clin uh, BD uh, associates spending roughly 20% of their time uh, in hospitals, helping relieve the full-time health workers. And uh, as I mentioned, we've been coordinating with governments to help allocate supplies. And I already mentioned that we have service engineers going in to the healthcare environment to service equipment. And these pictures, all these pictures, this is not stock art. These are all real pictures of our people either working with the US military to, to coordinate deliveries or on the lower right, that's one of our associates working in the clinical environment and, and he's exhausted like so many other health workers are. And we're doing our best to, to recognize you know, these people as heroes within, within the company. So, I mentioned that on the policy side, we've been doing this for some time. And, and in general, I would say as an organization, one of the reasons I've stayed 36 years in the same organization, which is almost unheard of these days, is because this devotion, this, this, this purpose-driven drive to use our capabilities to accomplish good, particularly with respect on med health needs, has been embedded in the company pretty much since its founding. And there's a very proud history there. And having been there so long, I'm kind of one of the historians as well. I'm not going to go through all these, but I can tell you that we were engaged in the first uses of human insulin back in the 1920s, in the first deployments of penicillin. Penicillin, the first antibiotic, was just kind of discovered in the late 1920s and wasn't put into use in, until 1942, uh, during the Second World War, as a way of treating infection on the battlefields. Uh, the method of drawing blood into evac an evacuated tube, which you can see on your lower left, that was invented by BD in the late 1940s. We had developed the first sterile disposable medical device uh, in response to a request from the Red Cross 
uh, in the early 1950s. And the picture on the upper right is Jonas Salk during the famous Salk polio human clinical trial, still the largest clinical trial in history. One million children uh, across all of the United States were tested with this vaccine, which turned out fortunately to be successful. There weren't enough medical devices, injection devices at the time to do that trial. So BD scaled up the first sterile disposable injection devices. They were still glass at the time and provide them on a nonprofit basis for the Salk polio trial. And then more recently, things we've done in tuberculosis and HIV, healthcare worker safety, safe immunization of children. This is all part of the history and sort of the underpinnings of the type of work we're doing today for COVID-19. And uh, starting, as I mentioned, in, in early 2000s, I had founded the Global Health Function at BD. And this is a function within the company that works across all the company's businesses and most of the geographies through cross-sector collaboration to address major unmet health needs in the world. And I'm not gonna go through this in detail. This is sort of a, an artist's rendering of what we're doing, but you can see COVID-19 on there. And I talked about that in detail, but there's even more detail behind each of these other areas that we've been working on for some time. And in all cases, we're working in collaboration with either government agencies. We've had, for example, up top Labs for Life. That's a partnership with the US government, the State Department, CDC, and PEPFAR, which is the president's emergency plan for AIDS Relief, who was founded by uh, by George W. Bush during his administration. We have a, a partnership going on now on its 12th year, where we strengthen laboratory systems throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, also in India, as an example. Antimicrobial resistance is an area I've been very deeply involved in, has a lot of parallels to COVID-19. We're engaged in many partnerships there as well. And I would say this is, of course, unique to BD as a company, but any company that has the potential for positive societal impact, and I believe all do, can be thinking about who could be their key constituents, their key stakeholders, and potential partners. And if they devote themselves, they devote their capability for positive social impact, they will find these other sectors and these other partners really interested in engaging with them. Um, and then just broadly, you know, as I mentioned, this is why I founded the, 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 corporate, the Institute for Corporate Social Innovation at Rutgers, uh, because I felt that there was, we're still in the early stages. We're still no further than the first quartile, in my opinion, to speak very generally, of the opportunity for positive social impact from the business sector. And we need the business sector engaged in this. Governments cannot do it, do it all on its own by any means. Nonprofits can't do this all on their own. And businesses have unique competencies in efficiency, in resource deployment, in know-how, and in taking things to scale. And one of the unique things about shared value creation is if you have a business model that has positive social impact, you can completely take it to scale. You can take it as far as the business opportunity goes. So I really was interested in seeing these types of capabilities embedded in business curriculum in a very practical way adding to, let's say, the more academic-oriented uh, work that may already exist in business curriculum and bring in some of these experiences from companies that are really good at this as a means of helping inculcate this in future business leaders and students, but also sharing it with other companies, which we do very openly to encourage them to follow this type of pathway. And the benefits back to the company, first, you're gonna have better customers, more loyal customers if they think you're a good company and vice versa, if they think you're a bad company, they're gonna steer away from you. It builds trust. I already talked about the importance of trust and stakeholder relationships. You actually can get information on new markets. Much of the work we've done in the developing world has given us insight on unmet needs that could create new market opportunities for us and help us expand our geographic expansion. Needless to say, um, when the CEO of BlackRock in his uh, letter to shareholders two years ago came out and said, look, companies need to be driven by social purpose. And if they're going to invest, they want to invest in companies that have positive social impact. There is a growing community of investors, probably for a company like BD, maybe 20, 25% of our investors now are looking at social impact as a key criteria for their investment. And by the way, they're the best investors. They're the ones investing for the long term. They're not just looking to get in and out of the stock short term. So this is important also for companies to attract investment for their own for their own capital, their own share prices. It also is very good internally, generates a higher level of workforce motivation and engagement, particularly among millennials and younger. I would say among everyone, but you know, if there's a lot of students uh, listening to this webinar, my guess is you're looking in your career, not just for career success. Most of you are likely also looking to accomplish something, to, to, to accomplish something in your life. We have this saying in BD uh, that you can accomplish your life's work through your work life. That's a real opportunity. More companies, if they do that, they'll attract stronger talent. And by the way, 
doing good keeps you away from doing bad. It's not an absolute guarantee, but if you have a culture within your organization to do good in society, it's less likely you're going to do something bad and stupid. Uh, I won't name the companies that have done this in the last five or six years. They're well known, but my goodness, the damage they did to themselves through missteps, through selfish behavior, went way beyond any benefit they may have ever gained from it. And uh, so I'm going to close there. I think that covers all my slides. I actually don't have a clock in front of me. Now I do. And I see we have 22 minutes left, which should offer us some good time for questions. Absolutely. And we have a ton of questions on the line. So thank you all for uh, submitting your questions. And if you want to continue, we'll be going through them uh, for the rest of the time now. Uh, before we do that, go, Gary, I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one being, you know, how can companies that are just getting into this space get started? So obviously BD has had a longstanding history. Um, what do newcomers to corporate social innovation need to know? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by example, and then I'll I'll, I'll generalize it. But I'm going to uh, it's a big example, uh, and I will call out a specific company, and I'm going to slightly criticize them, and I'm going to compliment them. And the company is Walmart. You know, it wasn't that long ago that Walmart, uh, let's say before Amazon becoming as strong as it has become, they were under threat. But the threat wasn't from competitors. The threat was from their own internal policies of not offering healthcare benefits to their workers, perhaps not paying their workers a lot, that started to impact their reputation. And I think they started to realize that, but then Hurricane Katrina hit. Uh, and it hit in an area, you know, not far from where their headquarters is and sort of their presence is. And they started to respond, much like maybe we're responding to COVID-19 now. And they understood that their capabilities in distribution, their access to food through their food distribution, they were able, water, essentials, they were able to start deploying those things and they start to get it. They start to say, wow, if we're able to do this and have such an impact, maybe this should become part of our business strategy. I actually learned this from Michael Porter. And since that time, I have to say, Walmart has been doing a lot of good things. And I'm not here to praise them. I'm not here to criticize them. I'm here just to observe what's happened with Walmart as a company. They're doing a huge number of good things. They, they kind of got the religion, if you will, that doing good in society is actually going to be good for business. So the way I would generalize that is now to say companies just need to take stock. Think about what industry you're in, what expertise you have, and how that affects society. And you will find areas that if you just shift your paradigm, so much of this is just mindset. And you shift your mindset from saying, really, I'm only concerned about what competitors are doing and where the threats are coming in from and my own survivability. And maybe I'm concerned about my personal income. That gets you in the wrong place. You think about, wow, I have all these capabilities. I have a, a talented workforce. We have tremendous expertise. We have products or services that are... Um, Sorry, I thought I was getting a text about this. I wasn't. We have products or services that are very instrumental, not only in our own success, but also in, in doing good in society. And put those pieces together and then think about who would you need to work with to be able to put those in, into force in a manner that accomplishes social good. And then think about those four methods. Philanthropy, which is where most people start. It's the easier one. Social responsibility, how do you use your capabilities for social good? Advocacy and policy, how do you get out there? You know, one point on healthcare worker safety, we were among the activists. We were among people who otherwise probably would have been criticizing industry's response, but we were working hand in hand together and they trusted us and then shared value creation. How do you use business models? Because you can really take that to scale. That's the way I would suggest getting started. Fantastic. And just to bring it back to your presentation, how do you think this will look post COVID? Obviously the healthcare industry is, is very involved now and will continue to be, but how can all companies respond? Well, here's my, what I think is the opportunity and I'm also gonna have a concern. The opportunity is we have more companies practicing corporate social innovation now than any time I can ever remember out of necessity. And look, you know, it's funny what I watched, observed, I should say, is how advertising has changed. And I have to say the ad agencies are very creative people. They're on top of things. You can hardly watch a commercial now that doesn't have a COVID-19 tie-in because if they don't, they're probably considered irrelevant. And then there, there are some really good ones that are saluting health workers or the ones saying that, hey, our workers in supermarkets are frontline workers too. I completely agree with that. Thank goodness we're appreciating like never before people in society 
who probably were overlooked before. And now we know that the fact that they're willing to go to work is the reason we're able to sustain ourselves because we can get our nutrition by by, by shopping. And then you have others, I won't name the company, but there's one saying, hey, we really care about you. And that's why we're offering uh, low rate financing on your next new vehicle purchase. It just doesn't work for me. But everyone's tying it in. So I think right now, everybody's thinking about it. And that's the opportunity. The concern is they don't, maybe even realize that they're practicing corporate social innovation. Companies are just doing this kind of instinctively now. Do they realize, much like Walmart did in response to Katrina, that this is actually a better way of doing business? And you're going to have more loyal customers, a more dedicated workforce if you keep at it. So that would be my key message. Take stock of it. Take a step back at some point and say, what are we doing now that's different? How do we keep that going? How do we take on another big problem past COVID-19 when eventually we get past COVID-19? Um, and to talk about the post-COVID-19 world, uh, we have a question from Amanda Gardner, um, formerly from one of our partners, Verizon. And actually, the, the question is, how will BD engage post-COVID around the environmental and societal impacts of the pandemic? And will there be some sort of response there around the economic conditions, for example? Well, the question about economic conditions is a very good one. I, I think we haven't seen the full impact yet of the economic ripple effect, I can even use the term fallout, that will be an outcome of the record high levels of unemployment. No one knows exactly how that is going to play itself out. And there is a lot of stimulus going into the economy. I, I, I like the direction now Congress seems to be willing to go to put that stimulus into keeping people working rather than just taking care of people who are out of work. It should be both. But Countries in Europe uh, and Asia have put much of their stimulus into keeping people working, keeping them in their jobs, and then bridging that over to the point where it could be sustained just through regular economic activity. But BD will remain engaged. I mean, we are in this industry, and preparing for future pandemics is one of the ways that we keep we will keep engaged. Preparing for vaccination is a very big issue for us because we're the world's largest supplier of injection devices, and we're really pushing governments now to say, look, you got to plan ahead. You know, if you need a billion injection devices, we can't just flip a switch and turn that on. We're ready to plan ahead with you now so that we can be sure we have what we need. Everybody thinks about the vaccine or the drugs. In our industry, we're always a little bit of the Cinderella because people don't think about the devices or the diagnostics, but you can't do the drug delivery or the vaccine administration unless you have the devices and, and in many cases, the diagnostics. And then the economic impact, well, we've been, you know, we've been doing a lot. You know, we, we, we launched a fund uh, to help our own associates. Uh, we've had to furlough some associates because, unfortunately, uh, elective procedures are way down as a result of COVID-19, and that impacts our business. And But we put a fund in place to help those associates who are furloughed, and that's within the organization. And then through our work in philanthropy, you know, supporting organizations that are, that are helping the most vulnerable, that is a significant way. And then, hopefully, by restoring our own economic performance so that we can uh, c continue hiring. You know, we have a hiring freeze on now for all non-essential positions. We're in the same boat there as most companies are in. And I guess in our case, we're fortunate that we're in an industry that is not as impacted as industries such as travel, sports, entertainment. You know, that's going to be a tougher recovery from them. But hopefully at some point, you know, the new normal will kick in. It won't be the normal we all once knew, but it'll be a new normal. And, you know, in as much as we're not going to go back to the way it was, I do think now people are so fixated on what's happening that they think this is going to be like this forever. It won't be like this forever. It'll be like this for some period of time. Things will gradually start opening up, but we will recover to a new normal with hopefully an ongoing recognition of the risk of pandemic diseases, the need to practice good hygiene infection control, the role of diagnostic testing in society. These things I'm hoping will remain with us so that we're better prepared for future pandemics. Great. Um, I'm just going to try to go through as many questions as I can, but um, there are so many. So this is an interesting one. Um, how does the budgeting and go no-go -go process work for corporate social innovation at BD? Um, is this a cross-functional committee? How does it work? Well, you know, I would it, it would it would probably sound really good if I told you that you know this is all just an extremely like orchestrated process that follows a particular flow and it's been published in the Rutgers Biggest Business Review and and the top three consultants are now teaching on it. But it's really it's not it's not that clear cut. It varies 
by the different areas that I mentioned, the different methodologies. I'd say a lot of it is need driven, which I think is really important that we're responding to, or in some cases, even getting ahead of key unmet needs. And then it varies. If it's philanthropy, we have two methods. We have a, a, a budgeted philanthropy called social investing budget, which has a, a committee, an internal committee called the corporate contributions committee. And then we have a foundation, which is an independent legal entity and it has its own board. And they're the ones who propose and then agree upon, decide upon, and approve uh, philanthropic donations. Corporate social responsibility varies by area. We have a, a sustainability group in the company that works on many areas, including environmental sustainability, and they have their own projects and activities that they engage in. Uh, within the global health team, a lot of what we do is CSR, and we have our programs that we propose are cross-sector collaborations, and those get budgeted each year. Uh, our advocacy and public affairs work is done both by our public affairs personnel. We have a, not only an office in D.C., we have about 30 people working in public affairs throughout the world and countries throughout the world, and our global health team engages in, in advocacy and policy work as well. And then shared value creation is within the operating units, although our global health team has been a center of excellence for working with the operating units on further promoting shared value creation. So it's it's kind of spread throughout the company. And I'd say the glue that binds it together is the culture of the company and the purpose of the company. You know, our case is called Advancing the World of Health, but it's a purpose devoted around our impact on society. Fantastic. Um, and can you give examples of how this enables more effective market penetration? Obviously, it's great for the company and it's also been great for your growth. So I'm really curious to hear more about that as well. Well, I can give some specific examples. Um, the work on healthcare worker safety, which I referred to early on, I was personally involved and I initiated that strategy way back in 1988. And I was not at a very high level of the company, but at the time there was concern about HIV spread among health workers. And it was, even though HIV had been around for almost a decade, it wasn't really until the mid 1980s or so, a little less than a decade it was around. I say late 1970s HIV was identified. And by early 1980s, it was known that there were high risk populations, but it wasn't until 85, 86, 87, when two health workers zero convert HIV from an occupational injury, that the risk in healthcare environments really started to come to light. And there were some, as I mentioned, advocates, even activists out there. And when we understood uh, that accidental sharp object injuries like needles could be a source of spread rather than deny the issue. And by the way, our customers were not very concerned at that time health administrators were not calling attention to this. They would say, well, you know, the nurse was being careless, you know, she stuck herself or he stuck herself after doing a procedure. But we understood that as the leading producer of needles, that we were in a, in a strong position to do something about it. So we actually started partnering with the activists. And once they understood that we were on the same page and that we would support what they were trying to accomplish, we were able to collaborate with them in some cases, collaborations that continued for, for 30 years. And then we started investing massively in adding additional protective features to the devices, integrated into the devices as we were working on policy. But even that wasn't enough because there wasn't really a lot of awareness of the issue. And so we started investing in educational programs with professional societies that offered continuing education credit and surveillance systems that hospitals could, could implement within their hospital, which also hospitals shared their data and it formed a national and then a global network of data and data drives change. And that's why that was so critical. And manifesting all that Ultimately, this became the largest single source of organic sales growth in the in the company in the last 30 years. So this was a very practical example of how a social need translated into a very viable business opportunity. That's also happened with HIV and AIDS. It's happened with uh, childhood immunization, making childhood immunization safe. Uh, disease was being spread due to reuse of single-use immunization devices, un, uh, uh, let's say inappropriate reuse. And we developed a low cost, very low cost technology for pennies that would not, it would be physically impossible to reuse. Again, we collaborated with major agencies and eliminated that category of disease spread among the world's children. Those are all examples where we had to use our business capability to achieve the social impact. And by doing so, we also created a business opportunity. Fantastic. And just going back to the data question, actually, um, somebody's asking about data that shows that companies that do good also do well financially. And um, we can answer that as well through the Institute's perspective. But I'm just wondering about your perspective as well. 
Well, the first is uh, the quiz. Who, who, was, who, who is the term doing well by doing good attributed to? No, I know you know the answer because I put this question in front of you and I, I can't see your responses. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to give the answer. But anyone who said Benjamin Franklin would be correct. Imagine the, the notion of doing well by doing good in business goes back to, uh, to Benjamin Franklin. But there is data showing that companies, either those that are purpose driven or those that have positive social, social impact, are outperforming other companies, particularly those that are most proficient at it, and they're attracting more investment. And by the way, one thing I learned personally, once I put all, you know, a, a substantial amount of my own personal savings, uh, at least the the equity portion of my personal savings, I put into social impact funds and ESG funds, and they've been outperforming traditional funds. So I mean, that's doing well by doing good as an organization, is doing well by doing, or doing good by doing well personally. I, I, there's just really no downside to this, but it requires that mindset shift. If 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 business leaders are just going to think in a traditional sense, uh, motivated by threats more than by opportunities, motivated by personal gain rather than beneficial collective impact, then it doesn't happen, and it can't be forced or feigned. You know, one of my big concerns is that people will start acting like they're doing it, but they're not sincere. You really have to walk the talk on this and not talk the talk. You know, sometimes. Sometimes people say, talk the talk or walk the walk. It's not talk the talk or walk the walk. Talk the talk means saying what you're saying. Walk the walk means doing what you're doing. Walk the talk means saying what you're doing. and uh, Or doing what you say, excuse me. Doing what you're saying. And, and if you're going to profess to be a company that is going to be strong in societal impact, you have to prove it through your actions, not just through your words. Wonderful. Um, this is a question from one of our student advisory board members. Um, as a policy matter, would you suggest the U.S. offer tax breaks for companies to invest in CSI initiatives? Well, tax breaks is a big question, but I do think in general. So let me not answer specifically around tax breaks, but I do think incentivizing companies to do the right thing is generally a good strategy as long as it's not manipulated and abused. Um, I mean, companies get tax breaks now for other things. Some of the tax breaks companies are getting now are probably damaging society more than helping society. Uh, and some are maybe oriented around employment. And I do think particularly in today's day and age with COVID-19, it's important to incentivize employment. But in general, if there could be ways that are measurable and verifiable to offer incentives for companies to do good in society, I, I think it's probably a good thing. I would need to know and see the specifics to know how comfortable I, I think it's probably better than just forcing sort of regulation that punishes companies or you know at a minimum there, there should be a combination of incentive and disincentive fantastic and i believe we have time for one more question um this is if there is one area that you think needs more social responsibility or innovation what would that be aside from COVID, obviously if there's one area that needs, well, I, I would say it's inequity in our society. There's never been a time in human history or recorded human history where the gulf between rich and poor is wider than it is now. And this is not just the U.S. It is in the U.S. for sure. It's everywhere in the world. And we used to say there were rich and poor countries. Now there are rich and poor in pretty much every country. And, you know, one one shocking statistic, in my view, is that the top three wealthiest individuals in the U.S. control as much wealth as the bottom 50 percent of the population. And you have so much of our society that's living on the edge and circumstances such as the current one, just losing employment for a few weeks puts them under the waterline. Or maybe the only reason they were over the waterline is because they were carrying debt. And it's not sustainable. This, this trend started in the early 1980s with deregulation and tax reform. It may have been well-intended, I'm not sure, but it's caused this gap in society that is, it's, it's, it's not only unsustainable, it's just, it's just downright wrong. There's been virtually no income growth since the early 1980s for much of the population, whereas the wealthiest segments of our population have had uh, massive income growth. And I'm not, again, I'm not speaking politically here. You know, I'm not getting on a, a particular, uh, partisan policy agenda when I say that. You know, there are plenty of raging capitalists who are saying the same thing. There's a very good book that was written by the retired CEO of, uh, I think it was J. Walter Thompson, one of the big ad agencies called uh, Capitalists Engage, I think it's called. I may not have exactly the right title, but uh, 
it, it speaks to this issue. It has to be addressed. It's not sustainable. And I'd say somehow we have to turn our attention to making society more equitable. The, the most wealthy don't need as much wealth as they have. Many of them are trying to do good by reallocating that wealth somehow through their philanthropy. You know, you have people like Gates doing great things, but we've got to also reallocate it by having more income growth for middle and lower income people. And we don't need as much for the highest income, in my opinion. It sounds like it really goes back to doing the right thing, right? Both as an individual, as a corporation, and as a country, I think it's really about aligning incentives and, and making sure that we're doing the right thing by society and that that will lead to positive benefits across the board. It's also structural. You know, I, 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 you know, I, I Bill Gates is trying to do as much good as he, as he can. Paul Allen certainly has done tremendous good. It's not the individuals. It's the structures are allowing this to happen. And it's almost happening like the way water flows. And you know, if we had a dam and the water coming out of that dam, if 90% of it went to three people and or 50% went to three people and the other 50% of that water flow to half the world, half the population, it wouldn't work. And you know, those those flows are just not working. And we it, it's a structural issue. We have to be willing to change that structure. I don't think it will cause any harm to the most wealthy. It can do tremendous good for those who really deserve at this point to have some income growth. And if there's any good that comes out of this pandemic, I think there will be a number of things that are good that come out of this. We would never wish it upon ourselves. But the appreciation for the vital people in society who keep society going, they deserve to have a more balanced life and not be living on the edge the way they are. And this is, again, it's all over the world. It's not just here, but it is here. We're the wealthiest country in the world. So much of that wealth is in private hands. Uh, and that's why we're not getting, you know, greater benefit from it. And, uh, you know, and again, I'm not speaking politically. I'm not so far to the left or to the right. This is just the right thing to do. Mm. Any final words of wisdom before we wrap up? It's it's just a few minutes before one. So I want to make sure we give you the final word, Gary. Well, first, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Hopefully, I will not have offended anybody with my opinions. And hopefully, there will be, you know, some interesting takeaways from here. I would really encourage you if this type of subject matter piques your interest at all, get engaged with the Institute for Corporate Social Innovation. That's why we founded it. And this is gonna be a place where best practices are identified and discussed. And it's still in its early stages. So you have an opportunity to actually put your, your fingerprint, if you will, if you wanna get engaged on how this moves forward. And we've already rolled out curriculum for graduate students. We'll soon be rolling out curriculum for undergraduate students. You get access to phenomenal students through this program. And if you're a company, you can learn a lot. And for those companies who really wanna be committed, I, I'd be happy to engage with them personally as well if that, was, uh, if that was of interest. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Gary, for your time and your energy and your thoughts. I know I learned a lot from our conversation and of course everyone who tuned in, thank you as well. It's my pleasure. So Noah and Gary, that was amazing. Thank you so very much. Um, and to our audience who supplied just the fantastic uh, questions. It was a really energetic, amazing discussion. Um, so awesome. Um, so a friendly reminder to everyone who's listening, the RBS uh, Signature Leadership Series takes place bi-weekly on Thursdays at noon Eastern time. And as you can see, we have an exciting schedule of business leaders lined up to sit down with us over the next several months. For more information, you can always visit our webpage, business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. Um, we want the series to continue to meet your needs, so please stay online um, briefly for just a mo moment longer as the webinar ends because you'll immediately see a very brief survey about today's event. And finally, as I mentioned when our webinar began, a link to the archived recording of this presentation will be shared via social media and emailed to you. It will also be uh, found on the Business Insights page of our website. So thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again, and thank you, Gary, and thank you, Margaret. My thank pleasure. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.